Welcome back to the 2018 MSI Play, and I'm here with White Lotus after a very back and forth game here. Obviously, your first game back. It felt so controlled in the start, uh, but did the game, with all the control you had, did you expect the game to kind of be as chaotic as it ended up being? Okay. <risa> la verdad pensé que o sea, iba a ser mucho más fácil. Eh, yo personalmente jugué demasiado mal las teamfights, como que me sentía bastante nervioso desde el principio. Hace rato no me pasaba, creo que es porque es mi primera partida de vuelta. Me sentí bastante nervioso y creo que eso afectó un poco. Pero siento que con el correr de las partidas simplemente va a mejorar y mejorar y creo que voy a, estar, o sea, voy a dar el, el desempeño que realmente puedo dar. He says that uh, he personally feels that he played uh, really bad at the beginning. Uh, he thinks that he got really nervous. Uh, maybe it's because he hasn't played in a while and now being here is all the pressure. Uh, so he thinks that that's why the game become, became really chaotic. Uh, but now he feels confident that with the next games he will regain his confidence, he, he will perform. And obviously it's very tough to have to sit out for so long. Can you tell me a little bit about what that experience was like, but also what it's like now kind of being back on the team? Eh, bueno, yo en, mientras estaba suspendido, como que estuve en mi casa, eh, entonces como que donde yo vivo el internet es muy malo, no pude practicar mucho, así que vengo con súper poca práctica, como una o dos semanas con el equipo, pero es el mismo equipo con el que vengo jugando hace dos años y como que tengo mucha confianza en el que nos va a ir bien. He mentions that uh, while he was suspended, he stayed at, at his home and the internet isn't really good that, back there. So he couldn't practice as much the last three months. And he's only been practicing with the team for two weeks now. So uh, he uh, feels like he needs a little bit to, to remove his rust in, in some way, but it will be fine for the upcoming games. And obviously my final question is that you've uh, had a lot of success in the playing stage before, performing well on big stages. For you personally, what's a, what's a success for you to kind of prove yourself once again on this stage? Hace unos dos o tres años que mi objetivo sigue siendo el mismo. Quiero llegar a Groove Stage, ya sea de MSI o de Worlds. Quiero jugar contra los mejores de carrera del mundo. Y espero que este año sea el, el año en el que lo pueda lograr, porque hace tres años que no puedo. His objective has been the same for the last two or three years. Uh, he wants to play the, on the group stage either MSI Awards and play against the best AD carries in the world. And uh, the following, the, from the last question, he also mentioned that he's been playing with this same team for two years, so he's confident that he will get uh, his group back. Basically. Well, clearly working out very well. Good luck in the rest of your game. Thank you very much for the interview. Well, thank you very much, Pastry. Fantastic to hear from White Lotus. And I love that he just came out and he said it. We have to get further this time around. This is the goal that I've been working towards with this team, X Lion, now Rainbow Seven, for three, four years. They have to take that step further. And they got their first win. It was shaky, yep. but they still won it. So the first step is taken. Yes, it certainly was. And we saw a clear difference in the Lion Gaming or Rainbow Seven of old, where they, in the past, often won through their sheer mechanical prowess over the other player in opposition. They were just straight up better. But this time we saw much slower yes. in the game. We saw them taking their time. We saw some amazing team fights because Ascension, they were bringing the firepower back themselves. And that was the thing. I was getting a little bit frustrated there, especially in the dragon fight. I was just like, wait a second. You can get the kill very easily. Just go for it. But you saw that they were just taking it back slowly, recognizing that going up against this Ascension, those are the fights they want to be looking for to get themselves back into the game. So you saw a lot more, I would say, slower macro-based play from them. And I think a more competitive game than you guys had expected. Oh, sure, yeah. I just want to go ahead and pull up your predictions. At the beginning of the day, you did have Rainbow Seven as the undisputed Disputed number one in the group going three and zero, but I'd like to say that Raz is, is, is mentally a bit ahead because he did say that Ascension would be better and close to Rainbow Seven in skill. So go ahead. Look, maybe I was a little bit sweating because it felt like Ascension <laughs> was going to overperform and take the first place. That's that, yeah. that was like, wait a second, I actually could have been wrong there. But no, it really does show the fact that G4, Lloyd even, even though there was a certain points where he's getting underperforming in that game, that it felt like the confidence was there with the team to just look for those fights. So finding small windows to get that. But Raz, Raz. All right, I'm ready. We have to look at that game closely and identify how many times did G4 flash into the team fight when he didn't need to? Same for Lloyd. Yes, the aggression was great, well. but it is a little unfiltered. <laughs> and I feel like that Lion not perform, or Rainbow Seven rather, not performing at the level of which I expected, I gave Ascension a few e extra is, avenues. I think I'm going to challenge you a bit on that as we dive deeper into Ascension because they are still on stage. They went, of course, uh, off stage a bit to strategize for their next game. It is right now 
versus Gambit Esports, and that gives us a chance to take a closer look at some of those moments. And I would argue that the reason why they stayed in that game is because they were proactive and took those fights and, to be honest, played them really, really well. Now, I will definitely say that Ascension uh, in the full 5v5 looked impressive. For me, one of the star performances was their support Rich. Yes. His Rakan was impressive. He was always in the right place at the right time. And I loved the way he was setting up his team for success. Well, a big turning point in that game was Ascension taking the Baron straight from Rainbow 7. We're going to take a look at it. Brought to you by Acer Predator because that was really what the mid game and the late game was about. Ascension kept being competitive. Yeah, I was wondering why Audi specifically walks in. But of course, look at the HP of the Baron. So it makes it very easy for Ascension to take the fight because they could have burned the, ba uh, the Baron itself. So it was a major mistake from Rainbow 7 to have the Baron that low to begin with. And if it's going to be low, then you have to commit, you have to take that 50-50. On the other side, Ascension had been taking a couple of those fights. And as you say, when they find themselves in a 5v5 position, they look scary. Yes, they did. Uh, and while uh, you can make the argument like, was this a bad decision from Lion? Was this a good opportunity for Ascension to kind of punish? The point is, these guys look good when they fight. When they are grouped up as a five-man unit, they play with a lot of confidence. They are not afraid to get into the thick of things and look for those opportunities to build leads. So Lloyd and G4 are two of the playmakers that I think could win their team the game, but also could lose it. So that they're a little volatile for me. And compositionally, a lot of it is a much easier for Ascension if they get some range in there, if they get some late game scaling aspects because they were able to win a lot of those team fights, but they were put in really bad positions. Yeah. One trundle pillar comes up and then suddenly it's always, we have to all in on this. Otherwise we get poked, we get chipped down and we lose objectives after that. Well, be it as it may, they played well, they tried to do it, but they couldn't. And now they're down one game, going into the next game immediately up versus Gambit Esports. So let's talk about Gambit Esports and what we saw from them in their very first game. They beat. KLG. They beat KLG. Yeah, that's how it is. And especially for me, what was interesting is that Diamond, a guy who I don't think performed that well at World 2017, he played quite well in the early game, and he really gave that bottom lane of Gambit a huge advantage going into that first game. Yeah, for me, the bottom lane, this replay right in front of the screen was incredibly impactful because KLG needed to be ahead of the pace early on. He got the first push, but immediately dying that early made it incredibly easy for Diamond to be able to play to this dive right here, be able to just look for the counter gank or at least the counter dive. So it worked out very well for Gambit just because strategically that's what they set themselves up for. And I feel like Diamond was just very smart about his play. When we were looking at how the map was set up, you recognize, okay, I'm up against the Graves. Likelihood is I won't have priority over mid and top. I need to change my early game up in order to get myself a healthy early advantage. And or rather not to fall behind. And it felt like that they just caught Chaos Lightning Gamers yeah. completely off guard. And that just kind of showed the difference in between the two jungles. Well, definitely. And I think it also shows the preparation from the side of Gambit. They came in where usually they like to play with Diamond and Kira. Now they said, no, we're going to play through bot. We're going to set that rookie Lodic up. And he performed well in the end and just made sure that they were prepared into game one. And that really surprised me because uh, Lodic, given that he was the rookie of the team and given that during the regular season and during their playoffs, Kira and Steos were usually the players that they would look to play through. The fact that they put so much priority on him was very much a clear plan of, okay, we know this team loves the uh, camp bot. We can just put our top laner on a gangplank because he's not going to get ganked. Yeah. And we just do as much as we can to mitigate the pressure. And Gamma did a phenomenal. So overall, good showing from both teams, even though Ascension wasn't able to pick up the win. So if we look at the jungle, we talked a lot about Diamond. And I know you had Interesso of Ascension in your players to watch. How do you think this is going to match up? And here, the fun thing about this is even though Diamond had a really really good matchup here. He went up against KLG and he looked to overperform. I think it's just a little bit misleading because Intreso went up against Audi, who is a super strong jungler with a really good composition. So I think that Intreso is going to do incredibly well in this specific matchup. It all comes down to the picks here to watch just because if Intreso has the ability just from the lanes alone to look to invade, he will do so. And Diamond Prox in the region of the LCL has been prone to getting picked off when he does play Kha'Zix. So last game, he got Trundle. You can, you can just tank up quite a bit and get the heck out of there. I want to see if he gets that trundle pick one. And is this where you put the faith in Ascension so far that you say they're going to beat you Gambit in this game? Yeah, <laughs> like they have to. Like a legitimately, if that doesn't happen, I'm already out of here. Yeah, <laughs> right. For me, I feel like this matchup is going to be very top focused. I think we're going to see a lot more jungle attention towards the two top laners, both Rocky and Stajos, uh, just because that typically you don't play through bot side if you're both these teams, even though they've shown to be a little bit more aggressive yes. so far in this tournament. Uh, and Who I think wins? that for me, Diamond should have the edge. 
Switch. It just feels like Gambit are coming in extremely well prepared, and they should read the play style that Ascension are bringing. I love it because it's the first time that you guys have a split vote. We have one Ascension Let's vote go, and one Let's go. Gambit Esports vote. Let's see who can do it. Take it away, Dracos and Rusty. Thank you very much, Shox. Of course, we are ready for Champion Select. So Gambit and Ascension, they're gearing up. This is going to be their second game of MSI 2018. Gambit will be on the blue side. Now, as we head into Champion Select, it's important to remind people of the lineups. New faces, some of you might not remember. In the top lane, it will be PvP Stehos. In the jungle, it's going to be Diamond Prox. Rusty, you can see them I now can. on your screen as we get ready for it. In the mid lane, it'll be Kira, AD Carry Lodic, Support, Edward, and their coach, Atremains. Of course, they're a team that got a victory for their first game as well, so a very good side. And going against them, it is Ascension Gaming, which is in the top lane, Rocky, Jungle, Interesso, Mid-G4, AD Carry Lloyd, their support, Rich, and their coach, Cabbage. All right, and as we get into it, already three bands knocked down. Two mid laners, a top laner taken off the board. Gangplank not going to see the light of day this time around. PvP Steo is going to have to mix up what he wants to bring to the table. Yeah, and remember the number one priority champion that we may actually start to see in this champion select. We mentioned it in the last, but even more so now as we have a sample size, is Rakan. Both Edward and Rich played it. Naturally with Rakan comes Zaya, and we saw a lot of it on the red side, particularly from Ascension. So something that you may want to see taken away with a pick or a ban here is that champion, or one of the duo, you should say. Now the question is, do Ascension take half the duo away? Is it the Zaya, is it the Rakan? Both supports the surprise standout. We heard him talk about on the desk how Edward Rich, both two guys that are, have been so clutch for their teams, bot lane focus, maybe not what we expected from either of these lineups, but it's been what we've been getting so far. The picks I want to keep my eye on us do Trundle and Rakan. Two very big picks in both of these guys' games so yeah. far. Trundle's the other super big one with Kha'Zix removed as well. No surprises that you will see the Rakan locked in first here. It's the opposite side that you will now look towards. Zaya very rarely picked as a countermeasure, when you've got Morgana, Caitlyn potentially still available as well, that may be the place that you start to look towards. Rocky was a very good Nah also, so they can actually late pick him on red side. Kaisa and Caitlyn, this is the first game that they've both been available. The question is, which one do Ascension Gaming want to take? They've got their pick of the litter, and it is going to be the Caitlyn locked in for them. A bit more mobility, a bit more options to get away from that Rakan with the 90 caliber net. And of course, having the Morgana to counter the Rakan as far as engage is concerned is always a possibility. You don't need to pick it now, but you do have to pick it earlier on into the draft phase. Now, you mentioned the Kaiser. It's a very big decision to actually choose to go for that when there is the Zaya available, when there is the duo available, but you are right, it is the Kaiser. And it's just, do you want to pick that into the 525 range versus the Caitlyn does not feel Bad good. matchup. Super bad matchup. It's not a matchup that you ever want to take, but you should still acknowledge that at the end of the day, you are still Kaiser. So you are still powerful if you get out of it. Hey, and they're definitely acknowledging that you're still Kaiser. You're still powerful. You can still scale up. It's like Lodic will be trying his hands like that on that. Unless there's something particularly spicy for Diamond Prox in the jungle, but I can almost guarantee that uh, Trundle will absolutely smash that matchup, so probably not the risk he's going to take. This is one of those moments where you may not want something like the Olaf because you have the Kaiser. Crowd control is usually the name of the game. Now, you could see a Sejuani. I still have a preference for Sejuani over the Zac, but I can understand what they're going towards if they look at this. Trundle Pillar stops Zac from going forwards. That is something that you have to remember, and if you're feeling real frisky here, Ascension, Janna is the other choice, because now you've blind picked potentially into a composition, the Zac. And this is, this is also a fantastic pick, this Morgana. This is difficult, Rusty. We were talking with Zyrene backstage. We were talking about Zach, maybe some potential options. And like the number one option that was just going to destroy Zach, that's a strong champion right now, is the Trundle. They get it. They can interrupt the engage. They have arguably the superior tank. Zach's not going to have any tanky stats here. But Diamond takes it anyway. I think a big surprise. Now as we enter the second band, top lane, mid lane, the focus. Kira not going to get the comfort picks in the mid lane. Similarly, Rocky not going to get the, his hands on that Camille. Definitely a champion that you should be scared of in the hands of Rocky. And of course, if you watch any international events that Kira has been at, he plays Anivia. So you can understand where that band goes away, even in the finals, having it focused away from him at moments as well. Between the mid and the jungle of Gambit, that's where most of the bands actually are directed towards. You don't really see anything taken away from PvP Steos, and he's known more for his tanky champions. The composition they've got right now, very good with those tanks. and. I know it's not often seen, but I feel like the Maokai is not a bad option here. And interesting, we see the Vladimir taken away, Ascension Gaming, not wanting to give that one over. And you know, we can see what a big team fighting threat it would be, and with so much engage on the side of Gambit, don't want to risk giving them such a powerful pick. 
LeBlanc actually going to be the follow up from the side of Gambit. Not a pick we've really seen so far. It looks like G4 will once again pick up the Swain. The flex potential is still there, however, but it was a pick that he found. So pretty good success at a few moments in the game. Yeah, that's true. Being on the red side, they can, of course, last pick towards their top laner in Rocky if they would like this time, but they can also bring G4 into the Swain and just counter pick to whatever is revealed now from Gambit Esports. So when you look towards the remaining picks here from Gambit, they've got engaged. They have a lot of engage. They don't have range damage. Their scaling is decent. One thing that they are missing, like we mentioned, potential of a Maokai. Orn does the exact same thing. It's range, follow-up, complementary types of engage. It's not committal like the other two are. It's really nice to have that Orn. One of the things that makes him such a strong tank is you're right. He's one of the only tanks with really reliable non-committal engage. Everyone else has to get into the face of the opposition, Zach included. And Kira now going to try his hands at the Azir. Saw how effective it was against Ascension in the previous game. And Got to imagine, G4 already getting some flashbacks. Maybe we're worried about what Kira can bring to the table on this champion. And that one is actually curious to me. Ryze tends to be the mid laner of choice when you've got the Kaiser compositions. Of course, Ryze is banned away. But it's something that has crowd control, tends to be it. You mentioned how good Azir was last game, how great its scaling was, and how effective it actually was into G4 in the Swain matchup. Well, that is something that we are seeing once more, simply because you have an easy and you have a free laning phase. And I love this, Rusty. You've got the late game carry from Caitlyn. It's there. You've got Swain as well up against the Kaisa and the Azir. Everybody else this just there to support that team fight, just there to make stuff happen. And both of these lineups, Ascension last game showing what they could do in late game team fights. We know Gambit 4, a lot of their late game team fighting in their own region, dominating the opposition. I'm a little worried it's going to be too aggressive in the early game. And and someone's going to get too big of a lead, we're not going to get to see those really close late game fights. It's entirely possible. At the same time, Ascension was solid through their laning phase. They tried to extend the lanes for as long as they possibly could as well. They want skirmishes, and the one thing that you might have said is a weakness through their draft, I would say has actually been shored up. The first thing is the late game scaling that a Caitlyn can now provide. They've got a composition to empower that Caitlyn as well. The Trundle in the jungle role actually has a decent jungle matchup as well. He's not the Olaf that can get caught out of position and cause some mismatches when fights do break out. We saw Entrezzo, even with that jungle advantage that he built up in the previous game, not able to make it amount to a whole lot. Maybe it will be a different story this time on Trundle. See what he can bring to the table. And the ops for that early Zeke's pairing that with the Caitlyn, definitely some team fighting potency on both lineups. Yeah, it starts to scale up just that little bit quicker when you've got the Zeke's available. When you've got the Trundle available, it's not a hard, dedicated support but it is something that can still empower your composition. And that is the name of the game right now. It's the bottom lane. It's can they influence the bottom lane at all? That is where the snowball starts. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Gambit Esports versus Ascension Gaming. Third game of the day. Can Ascension find their first win? And can Gambit move up to 2-0 in the group? And that Blood Moon is sick. <laughs> I get excited every time. I always try to like think of custom Skybox ideas. They wouldn't let me get the one where it's Quickshot and Officio kissing in the sky. They said that wasn't what I mean, I don't know. I mean, I tried. Surprise Party Fiddlesticks would be a great Skybox <laughs> <That was> background. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would ruin a little bit of the prestige of the event, but would definitely be a surprise party. It definitely would be a surprise. Now, of course, early game jungling is something that we've talked about in every one of our matches thus far, Rusty, and I think we have to hit it again here because we've talked about the jungle mismatch, how this might be in favor of Entrezzo. What does Diamond Prox actually do to make sure that he can't get shut down in the early game? I mean, the first thing you have to look at is the side of the map that they're going to be starting on often trundles. And often, actually, just most junglers right now aren't going towards their bottom lane 2v2 to start the jungle clear. And this is something that should actually be favoring the trundles. So when you look at Diamond Prox, what is he going to do as a response? There is this weird pathing that Diamond could potentially do, and of all people, right, it'd be Diamond that tries it, where you leash both Blue and Gromp at the same time. Because he's gone for more, more of a conventional start, he's just going to be behind. So what he has to do is find creative pathing to get into places, to get ganks off. Maybe go for a full clear, get the full camps, get the Raptors, the Wolves, everything down to scale up to level 4 and be that little bit stronger. Because ultimately, Entresso's actually already made the first steps. He knows. He knows. He says, if you're going to take that greedy start, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to hit you with this baseball bat. But the problem being that Kira has control. Again, G4 still picking the Swain, something that could actually be questioned if the idea is that you want to invade early, you want to control the jungle early. Well, it's not going to be the case. 
Vision's all you get. In the previous game for Ascension, we saw total control of the top side push, total control of the bottom side push, G4 being pushed in. This is very similar. The top lane now even, bottom still remaining in control of Ascension. The question is, with a different jungle pick, what can Entresso actually do here? He was one of the players to watch, the person responsible for enabling this Ascension lineup. And last game, while he did individually well, it was a little lackluster for team contributions. These well, trades are very poor right now through the middle lane. Looking towards the bottom lane as well as these uh, junglers start to progress on their merry way down. The one thing that worked well for Diamond Prox was that he got the level 2 gank off. That he was able to control the vision and do something a little bit more cheeky, perhaps super unexpected. But he's got a Kaiser Rakan this time around. It's not quite the Zaya Rakan duo for the extra range, the excess range on that engage. And Tresso, we mentioned the jungle matchup as to how a pillar can affect that. Well, that's actually a pretty big deal as well, especially through the skirmishes that happen. Harder to hit when you hit the late game team fights, however. Most trundles use their pillar to start fights by picking someone out. And you can see Entrezzo is tracking the jungle path of Diamond Park Procs, pinging out the Krugs, letting his team know that that's probably where he's at, that that's one of the few camps that he has remaining. He does ping it a bit early, but there is Diamond indeed, so well predicted in the end. Even without the vision, still doing his best to keep track of where the Zac could be, because of course if the trundle's not there, Zac's still a very terrifying engage threat. And honestly, most of these lanes are just super content if you're Ascension. Yes, you're losing mid lane, you don't have control in the mid lane, but it's not like a Zac is going to go in and punish you, right? So you're happy to just lose the lanes gracefully, try and lose the minimum as well throughout that. Ascension with a Caitlyn Morgana, just going to push forward. Constantly threatening, preventing a Kaiser from doing anything with the Rakan. And that's probably going to persist until level 6. At that point, you've already got potentially three points in the Morgana Black Shield as well. So it requires a significant amount of burst to actually catch someone out of position. And you've got the teleports as well from the Maokai and the Orn that could come across. And with the way that Rocky's been able to handle that top lane matchup, he's even gone for the Biscuits to sustain himself against the Orn. It's very well off. He just wants to keep the pressure up here on the top side, working out well so far. Going for the Aftershock as opposed to the Grass, maybe a little bit less immediate sustain, but the extended, the immediate trades rather will go in his favor. Just making sure that PvP Stales can't build any items for himself either, so really just trying to punish this Orn pick across the board. This is a super risky attempt at a dive if they go for it, but they are. Rezzo. Where's the pillar going to Diamond go? Diamond Prox is here. here. They're just going to back off. Chain CC does go in, but there's enough minions there to block the tower. Right now and Trezzo just going to get taken out. Beautiful counterplay by Diamond. Sniffing out the gank exactly where he needs to be. And that's not the first time we've seen this from Diamond. The sniffing out, as you mentioned, the fact that he's able to track him and be there at the correct time. We saw this in the first game from Gambit. We see it again in the second. Shows again he's got the brain. Edward. Knows the binding is gone, decides to go in. Take a bit of damage back in return, but this is so quintessential Gambit once again. Their ability to just turn any kind of aggressive action that the opposition goes for in their favor. So much of what helps them set up these early game leads. And we talked about, you know, Zach, hey, losing matchment in the Trundle. Trundle was going to have an advantage. Still might be the case in terms of the 1v1, but Zach getting an early snowball, maybe helping him speed up that jungle clear. It's going to make this a lot more difficult for the side of Ascension. And it's only really Trundle tracking the Zac if they meet each other 1v1. If they find each other, it always goes towards Entresso over Diamond Prox. But the ganks are still in favor of Diamond Prox for sure, having the Zac available. Super impactful if the Elastic Slingshot connects. And if it's just given to him on a silver platter, I think you would take that. And this is where... Oh, this is... This is a bit awkward. Diamond debating his next course of action. He's just gonna... He didn't even hit the Scryer's Orb. I don't think he wanted to reveal his position by doing that. Has now done it by hitting that Scryer's Bloom. So potentially would have wanted to hit it, but doesn't want to risk getting caught out as G4 clearly with mid priority at this point in the game. A little bit of a different story than what we saw in the previous matchup. Say I'm much more comfortable in this matchup clearly. Is Kira willing to take the back foot here? The push does come in for G4. Of course, Kira yet to back, so a bit tough. I think one of the most important things that we have to look at here, moving forwards for the side of Ascension, is that it's a Caitlyn composition ultimately. So we spoke towards how good they are when they hit the late game team fighting compared to what they were before. Is actually, hang on, G4. It's going to immediately get pushed back. That's the Emperor's Divide. Does have the Flash available, but just trading alt cooldown for alt cooldown. A pretty big win there for G4. Has control of the lane. There's no resources available for Kira. Doesn't have the teleport. So he actually just loses all control, all semblance of control in that middle lane. He's left to lose, and Diamond even there now. I'm sure that he's safe. But back to the Caitlyn point. No one fight, please, for like 20 seconds. 
Lloyd's a siege composition. Caitlyn's a big part of the siege composition success as well. So if you are the jungler of Ascension, even the teleport from the top lane, even G4 when he has his teleport available as well, you bring a bottom, you break the structures. That is how you open up the game for yourself. That's how you give yourself the mid-game strength. Ultimately, give yourself a gold lead to win the game. And at this point in the game, we just have to... Lodic has no wave there. Edward cannot help with that issue whatsoever. And Zach, a very similar story. And if a Trundle does show up, you just don't have the engage options. You really need to to stop this sort of siege. For now, though, Lodic and Edward are doing a good job of not letting that wave hit their tower. See how they keep that out. As it may just be a rinse and repeat for Entrezza. If you stay out running for his life, Pillar is going to come out. All the available for Entrezza, but they're not going to pull the trigger. They don't know where Diamond Prox is, and they don't want to take the risk one more time. Walked out full well there, Entrezza, of course, knowing that there was going to be two control wards in the bush. Just perhaps an opportunity, but in the end, not the kill. The blue buff had also just spawned, so... That could have been a place where he was expecting Diamond Prox to be. Perhaps draw the pressure, delay the blue buff even. Now they're going to go from coast to coast if you're in Tresso in this instance, because your own blue buff is available and G4 will be crying out for assistance. They do a push here in the mid lane just to try to get the priority. Make sure they can't secure the blue. Take vision control of this area. Diamond Prox heading down. He can clear his red or he can maybe come to contest some of the vision being placement. But Ascension not confident enough to go for any greater advantage of Dragon. So it will just be the blue buff donated as predicted, Rusty, over to G4. It does also force the passivity of the bottom lane of Lodic and Edward as well. They don't have any vision in the river. They had to place it just then as the control ward goes down. And now they know that it's safe. It's good timing, actually. If they wanted to bring Diamond Prox over, perhaps go for another counter gank. They've got two control wards set up for it, and you know that Intreso is trying to control Vision as his primary. Here goes Edward, the immediate engage. Immediately Camille with the follow-up, looking to land a few more shots, trying to get the passive burning down, but Lloyd is on the outskirts. Rich is still making out, and Trezo is there for the backup. Akira is off to the side. What are they actually going to be able to do? Out comes the Orn engage. Black Shield goes in, but Rich will still get taken down. Flash forward from Lloyd, trying to back it up. Kira in the middle of everything, exactly. pulled back. Diamond Prox, a beautiful fight to kick it off. G4, though, is going to do so much damage. Now running for his life. Lodic making it out as well. So far, two for one in favor of Gambit. Ascension Gaming just going to have to back off. Then you take that trade, you walk away, and you feel really good about it as well. You get two kills on the diamond. He is sitting pretty. Great engage follow-up from PvP Steos as well. Gambit, they show once more why their team fighting is so good. They do it for the second time on the international stage. They set their bottom lane up as well. They defuse the Caitlyn. They prevent and delay the major win condition that you need to see from Ascension. Terrifying to deal with, especially that Kaisa leaps in, but the exhaust stops the damage from coming through. But just look at this engage, Rusty. It's about hitting six, Edward, once again. We said Rakan will be a big pick. Well, it definitely still proves to be true. Lodic, no hesitation, uses the ultimate nearly immediately to get into the backline. He was super afraid of the binding. So he didn't maximize his damage output. Didn't matter too much in the end when Diamond's able to get the three-man ultimates like this and bring them all back towards his team. But at the same time, Kira has now been stuck between a rock and a hard place. Rocky in a hard place, unfortunately. And it really didn't have anywhere to go. And Rusty, already the fights are so close. You can see how many summoners are burned to try to dip and dodge and dodge all the Orn ultimate, all the CC. Both teams clearly comfortable in those environments where it's all about the individual mechanical skill and the team coordination. That said, Gambit coming out on top. Nice to have a little bit less than a 1K gold lead. We talked about the Kaisa. You know, she was supposed to struggle on the bottom side against the Caitlyn, this big lane bully, but 13 CS lead now, and just freezing the wave. Getting to the big item spikes, most importantly also, now you look at the items that she has, just the pickaxe and two daggers, but ever closer to the Gwinzu's Rage Blade. And there are three different itemization choices that Kaisers can go towards. We know Lodic wants to get that on-hit build now. Maximize his damage out at two items, maybe three. Continue to scale up and get the evolves. Lodic trying to get them to push in. He's ready to go. Their on is available. Want to go in. They've isolated Lloyd. Rich has split off. He's all on his lonesome. There's just no chance. Charmed up and taken down. Kill going over to Lodic in the end. The easy pick. Clean separation from Diamond as well. Landing between them. And the fact that the elastic slingshot connected. Removed the black shield. Removed all safety and availability from Ascension. So they just try and run away. Now they lose a kill. They lose a drag. And they start to lose even more. Everything that they could want. 20 CS lead on the Kaisa. 102 once again. Edward and Diamond kind of the crux for this team to go off. It is not PvP stay out in the top lane. Kira's been fine, but at the end of the day, it is support and jungle working together really to dictate the pace of this game. It certainly is. Tracking is the name of the game for the most part. That's how it started off super early, but that tracking gave them a potential iron on a snowball is now Steos. Chain CC does start to come in. One ulti is available. 
knock it back, but just wants to use the dash to actually make it out. Yeah. Clever from PvP Steos. Ghost just gonna get engaged on again. He's playing with fire, but he's got the banner of command. Soon the reason they come up there in the first place. That was a cute interaction from Steos, though, using the ultimate to headbutt himself a little bit closer to safety. Also, just watching two tanks try to kill a banner minion is probably the saddest thing I've, I've seen in a long time. It's a slow, it's a long, slow I think you need process. a Targons if you're, you're interested in this one. Maybe <laughs> speed up the process and be a bit, uh, a bit better. Team a bit of Vision 2. We'll, we'll put it up there for potential build options. And interestingly... Okay, Rusty. That's me. Longsword, I get. That could be the Tiamat that we talk about a lot when it comes to the Trundle Jungle. Mm -hmm. Dagger. What is the dagger for, Rusty? I think we let this one speak for itself. <laughs> it could be anything. Honestly, I don't even know if we're going to get a Tiamat at this stage. I think it might be a Triforce. That's extreme. I don't know why I think that. It's just the only item I can think of that includes both a dagger and a longsword. Yeah. All right. Welcome to the wonderful journey of what is in Trezo building, folks. We'll keep you updated. Berserker Greaves. More news at 8. All right. Keep you in. It's 13 minutes. We'll check in again as the items get completed. Find out exactly what's happening. And of course, on the subject of interesting build pass, I think we do have to talk about Kaisa. You talked about three potential build options. What are we expecting to see from Lodic? At least what his items indicate so far. I mean, option number one is the Essence Reaver build, which again scales super well into the late game, as you would expect with an Essence Reaver, maximizing the AD. Number two is the Death's Dance build, for when you want to dive people all of the time and still get the evolves. Very efficient way of actually getting that whilst being able to be a tank. The third one is, of course, the Gwinzu's Rage Blade. You can do as you would like from this point. You want to go towards the Infinity Edge as the third item and maximize all of your evolves. You could also go towards the uh, Nasha's Tooth if you would like to in there as well. So it's super variable and it's really based off what you want and what you feel because Kaiser, as a champion, if any of you at home have played her as well, like you have to get a feeling for what works for you and that tends to be what you stick to, even if there's a better option in items. See what the option is here now for Lodic if he wants to go for a few more daggers just to maximize that, get that evolve. For now, he is just going to back away, though. Supercharger does give him the stealth, so that one upgraded for now. Going to try to leap out to safety, but Rich, no hesitation there on that flash. The CC is still not going to come through, and Trezo actually taking a lot of damage back. TP's already being burned bottom side. But it comes the ult from the Orm. PvP Steos finding the follow-up as well. Good disengage from the Maokai ult for now. With body blocked behind the top laner. Senjin managed to disengage, but that was a fight that they wanted to take, still turning against them. Uh, lots of early pressure, actually, from Ascension. They're trying to catch out of position Lodic on the Kaiser. Because they were able to just disengage, they realized, of course, how quickly that became a mistake. They did, in the end, force teleports. And you might be thinking that's a good outcome, but they actually used a teleport of their own to match it once the first one came out. So nothing doing, but nothing gained overall. You got the summoners out of Lodic, and that is something that you have to look towards, however for the next three to five minutes. Can they capitalize on the summoners being missing from the Kaiser? Is an option. See what they can do, the ulti down as well. But now they're gonna look for the follow-up. Immediately Lodic does manage to step forward, trying to unleash as much as he can. Diamond Prox in the middle of everything, not gonna connect though on the stretching strikes. Here comes the TP, Rich now backing off. Pillar's Great. there to disrupt. Lodic all on his lonesome. G4 ready, does oh, manage to lock him down. Vision of Empire coming in clutch to close it out. Down the Prox now trying to run. G4 with the flash available. We know how he likes to play. No hesitation, but can't find the snare in the end. Now backing off. G4 still not hesitating to go under this tower. No Black Shield available means he's a bit more vulnerable. Maybe look for the Demon Flare. The slow, not going to connect. Ascension just going to grab a tower in the meantime, but PvP Steos is in the mid lane trying to fire back. Even forcing the flash from the end there out of Kira. It's a big win from Ascension. The fact that they're able to pressure, have that presence in the bottom lane does wonders for them. And getting that turret first, we spoke towards the presence this team composition wants to have. And the major point they want to execute on, well, that is step one. Unlock the Caitlyn. Now they can move forwards and they can continue to try and pressure the rest of the map. Unfortunately, the only person who can really take down these cannon minions reliably when they are empowered is the Caitlyn. Smite from Entrezzo along with a little bit of AD means he's also useful, but... Oh, and there was so much money, and now the turret's gonna take them all. <laughs> G4 continues to poke, but... I mean, essentially doing well to get that tower first blood. Matches up the gold despite the kill advantage for Gambit. They really gotta keep the momentum going. Kira, though, potentially in trouble. Does nice out the ulti. Rich. Not gonna find it. Kira does manage to make it out to safety. Rich is still impressing me more and more. I know that wasn't a big deal, but you can see the cleanliness coming out of the support of Ascension. And still G4 warming up on this swing. We're seeing a lot of good ease connecting, a lot of good 
claws are locking him down. Edward, of course, starting this fight off, getting the charm up onto both members. The Black Shield just a little bit late, but Diamond Prox unfortunately missing the Q, not going to hit the arms, knock them all together. And then Trundle arriving. Trundle, of course, very good at counter ganking, and G4 being here. Once more, able to execute on that counter play super well, and then it's just about getting under the turret, knowing your limits, and pushing Gambit to theirs. And of course, it's G4. He's playing Swain. He has a flash. It's a thing we've come to expect after game one. If he has it, he's going to use it. He's, he's going to be in the middle of the fight. He's absolutely making a trend out of his use of flash right now. Now, however, it looks like Malandrake will. Should go down in the favor of Ascension uncontested. People can stay out without any backup. But it will be traded in the end for Disrupt Herald. Just the one for one. Mountain Drake, though, going to be very helpful as Baron comes onto the table, but the immediate gold advantage might go in the favor of Gambit if they can use this to break down some towers. Yeah, it's going to take them a little bit of extra time, however, to lock down this Rift Herald, still with about 4,000 health remaining. Mid lane is the place that you want to be using it. And right now, because they have taken the first turret in the game already, Ascension, they're able to actually station their Caitlyn into the middle lane. So as far as actually getting this turret down with the Rift Herald is concerned, it's not an easy feat. Of course, the Static Shiv is also now available for Lloyd. He's got a lot of pressure in that 2v2 with the Morgana there to protect him. The wave's just always cleared by default. They have to bring multiple people here if you are Gambit to even utilize the Rift Herald to get that gold advantage and to get that turret to unlock the map. And of course, in the meantime, Lodek just building up ever closer. Needs one more dagger before he gets the evolution on that supercharge. Misspoke earlier when I credited him for having it, but the stealth will make it a little bit easier, especially if you do out Lloyd in those future scenarios, dodging a single auto attack from Caitlyn. Pretty important, <laughs> yeah. as it turns out. I think the actual amount usually will be Gwinzu's Rage Blade, Berserker Greaves, and three daggers. And that is the point where you'll see that every single Kaiser has got the evolve available. It also depends on levels, I believe, as well. Yeah, might need a few more levels. It's quite close. One more dagger will be just shy, but maybe a dagger and a level will get her there. For now, however, is the Rift Herald summoned. Diamond Prox careful to make sure not to summon it in range of the enemies. It will be mid tower getting broken. Yeah, they actually catch Ascension, sending their AD carry to the side lane. G4 still gonna remain in mid, so it gets the turret and they get a full health charge up onto the inner and mid lane. That is a significant amount of work done here by Gambit as a decision that Ascension made. And you can see that's what they get for trading the mountain for the Herald. It almost almost giving up 1k gold feels like giving away that tower. Maybe not what they wanted, but have to see. Maybe the mountain comes more valuable as we go further in the game. Maybe that will be the key for them to take a Baron. For now, however, it is Gambit who come out on top. And you can see they have control of the map right now, Rusty. Just look at how deep the vision is for Gambit into enemy territory. And essentially just feel like they're playing so far back. Yeah, that vision is very nice to have. It should actually spot people before they finish the rotations. It's not deep enough to see when the rotations are being started, however. That's where the risk is still going to be there for the Gambit roster, but ultimately we just watched Ascension, you know, be at a point in the game where perhaps something could happen in their favor. Perhaps they could stem the bleeding, slow the pace of the game down, control the mid lane outer turret, which is the most important outer turret in the game, especially when you're trying to place vision for the Baron now that it's up and available. That entry becomes a little bit riskier for them. You can see where G4 currently is next to that ward. You can't feel too safe to step past that point. And that's the thing, Kira on this control mage just has so much wave clear, and there's so few options. Banner of Command now coming in for Rocky, maybe that can make a difference, but some of that aggressive early play we saw from Atreso, where he was willing to go under a tower, you have to be very careful doing that against an Azir, especially when there is a Rakan, there is an Orn, there is a Zac, a lot of champions who could turn that engage against you. And we did mention this earlier, but when you actually have a, a lack of pick, let's say, from Gambit that is non-committal, it's a very difficult thing to execute on. So you've got the Orn ultimate. That's about it. But Orn is teleporting into the fight a little bit late. So what we are looking at right now between both teams is a Zack and Rakan that want to go forwards and a Maokai or a Swain that's trying to be a little bit less committal. It's about all in versus in and out. There's a Zack, but we're not going to connect. They are going to be able to pull the back load. It's going to do so much damage in this fight because he is left untouched and uncontested. And Tressa wants to do something, but he just can't do much at all. G4 wants to get it. Lodek trying to make his way out. He's just not fast enough. Kira, though, remaining untouched, but G4 just does not take damage either. Vision of Empire not going to connect. Diamond Proc's doing what he can, but the Black Shield coming in so clutch. Nice body block comes through. And G4 proving that he is still super dangerous right now, but Lodek already being dead. Lloyd already being dead. Both AD carries are gone. There isn't a lot remaining that will be able to secure objectives, secure structures, and change the pace of the game currently. And meanwhile, Rusty, constant bloodbath, fight on the top side. You know, going 
eye for an eye every time. Bot lane's still just chilling, dude. This is... Never every other inside. game, I feel like we've had uh, a little bit more of a dynamic top lane matchup. This time, it is the tank v tank is just... It's just come full circle. It's very nostalgic, you know? Whose banner minion can be more effective? Because the champions can't kill each other. And I can't speak for you, but I hope it stays as nostalgic. Because watching it is an experience. I mean, go. the tank with the Ocean Drake just wins every time, sadly. I just so. think we need to add sound effects to them. Not us, but the champions. They're a bit more impactful. But anyway, we get to watch the fight that happens in the top lane. Lloyd, of course, getting caught out. It was Diamond once again having a fantastic showing at this tournament. Lodic, from this position, they had the pick. It looked okay from them, but G4, super clutch, even with the flash there. Dodging out on the Azir ultimate. So Kira has no opportunities here to keep his AD carry alive. And he's left to just run away. Ascension have shown them mechanically throughout this game. They are still up there. Definitely keeping up, going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, punishing Lodek, who, you know, playing a more aggressive carry, doesn't really get to sit and stay back, and definitely not coming out on top in that exchange. I've worked it out. So we're back to this lane. Yeah. They should both have pool party skins. Ah, uh, that's true. Yeah. Or, I mean, pajama mount guy. Doesn't have sound effects, though. That's cool. I mean, his ult is cats. That's Bro's true. cats, Rusty. Yeah. The meowing. Oh, I love that skin. Always use that skin if you're a pro player and you're coming up. I will always support that skin. That is a matter of perspective. We're, we're at a point in the game now, Draco, so we're back to top lane, so I was... <laughs> uh, See, Baron is a place that we should be looking at. Baron, very important. Teleport's also important. I wanted to troll you and just go back to top lane, but we can stop. Now, <laughs> let's look at item spikes across the champions, because I think it's important to note who actually has an edge in the team fighting. We know Kira is going to scale better. He's on two items now. Is this enough of a break oh point for the Azir? Happened. The PvP stay is out of mana, though. Oh. There's, oh, there's oh, teleport. TP now coming in. Out of mana. Can they interrupt the Maokai TP? No, he still managed just to make it in. This might just be the pick that they need. Edward trying to find the disengage. Lodek trying to make his way out, but he will get locked up and taken down. AD carry removed. Ascension with control on the top side. And oddly enough, you take that if you're Edward, because only your AD carry goes down, but it feels like deja vu. The AD carries are the only thing that needs to die. Kira. On the opposite side, though, he'll get himself the mid lane in a turret, but that gives Ascension what they need. That gives them a window to push forwards. Look to the Baron. We want a tangible example. Jungler versus Jungler, who can actually get the smite, but it's Lloyd who is the priority of Diamond Prox, pulling them in, trying to start the team fight on his terms. Now pulling back, Lloyd uncontested on the back side. PvP Stales leaps into the middle of everything, but no one is there to back him up. G4, meanwhile, in the middle of three members, does get the ulti off the flash forward. Immediately they're pulling back. Action on two sides, a completely split fight, but PvP Stales is isolated. He's trapped and he is taken down. Advantage to Ascension. And there are tanks absolutely everywhere, but G4 is a tank that can also take you down. He's gonna have to go back to base, however, does not have mana, so the Baron is just gonna continue to stand. They're gonna have to reset one more time. And that actually gives Gambit an avenue to control the vision around here. But still, Ascension are fighting forwards. They're pushing up more and more. And if they continue to get these picks, things actually start to shift in their favor very quickly. I mean, exactly what they want. 2k gold lead, though, coming in for Gambit. Three towers to one, definitely still in control, but need to find more picks, and still so close. I mean, essentially playing on the edge there. That TP was so close to being canceled. You could see the leap in coming in from PvP Stales. He wanted to interrupt it. We are at a point now, though, with big item spikes. Once again, when you look towards Lloyd on the Caitlyn, he'd been sitting at components for an Infinity Edge for an extended period of time, but now he's got an Enderzeal. So getting those extra kills, getting those extra picks, and that influx of gold is something that works wonders for them. It's a gold deficit, like you mentioned, but that deficit feels far less impactful right now. Especially if you are Ascension, you may start looking once again. See what they can do with it. They can find a fight on their terms. Diamond Prox forced out of the pit for now. Has the Blast Cone to get back in if he wants to contest. Binding's hitting home for Rich. Rich, have, Rich is having a fantastic series for himself. Game one and game two. Right now he's gone for the Sorelia's Reverie, as is Morgana. Didn't choose to go for the Zonia's approach. Of course, this is a very good item now to pick up as Morgana in the support role. AP and the Talisman. Yeah, happy to have the movement speed. They really empower, especially G4. The aggressive flash user we know him to be may not always have to use it if you can go extra fast. It is risky when you use Black Shield on your AD carry, however. Bottom side, though. Zack ready to collapse here. Looks like it may be the 2v1. Two tanks, though, going up against the Swain. Will it end? Be what they want. Waiting for the ulti to expire. G4 is on the run. The rest of the team G4's of Ascension winning. going. 
He might just be able to take down a few more members. Now the ulti is gone, the healing is gone. G4 has the flash, may have to use it defensively. I think the first time of the day. The rest of the team not actually starting the Baron though. So this is pretty solid from Gambit. They get the ulti, they get the flash. Until those are up, this is a really good position to be in. G4 now with the fancy feet trying to walk his way out of this one. Nortax does manage to go over the wall, but it's... They not ha they don't have damage, but they have so much engage, Rusty. Go they like this is tough. He's gonna keep it going. We'll pull him back. It's gonna take him down in the end. The slowest fight of all time. I and think. Ascension on the opposite side are trying to get things done. They're trying to push forwards, but they've been completely held at bay. And the rest of the Gambit roster, three people in the end end up at bottom lane trying to take down G4 in the slowest, most gruesome, painful death that you've ever watched in League of Legends because it took a minute to actually lock him down. They get it, there is no trade, and then they get an objective for it. So in the end, it is a good play from Gambit. A lot of oceans today on the Amazon side playing Steve. Here's Champion Ocean, Triple Ocean in the last game, Double Ocean this time around, and a little bit more regen for these tanky members. Now, check-in. I said we get it at 18 minutes. It's, it's 28 minutes. Uh, Trundle it build. It is the Trinity Force. There's no other item I can put the dagger and longsword. <laughs> so Entrezzo wants to do damage. Kira might not be ready for how much damage this Trundle can do, but his soldiers are ready to push him away. Rich has and got that's the a speedy, speedy Rich. Kira, goodbye. Ascension now moving in. They managed to take out the mid laner. Pick after pick, single champions being traded on either side, but maybe this is finally the chance for Ascension to start a fight on their terms. Yeah, this is a great opportunity for them. They're not going to hit the Baron straight away, however. They want to continue to utilize the Morgana, utilize the Swain and the Trundle Pillar to find those picks. Remember, this Trundle isn't super tanky. It is a Trinity Force in the end. At the mountain, Diamond Prox channeling up, ready to go in. Leaps immediately onto the back line. G4 with the ult. He does manage to pull in, but Lloyd is left all on his lonesome. Lodek in the middle of everything wants to do a little bit more damage, but G4 is zoning as best he can. Lloyd is still alive, still free hitting. He's going to look to take down PvP Stay Out. One more. Diamond Prox all in on the mid laner. Finally, G4 does manage to go down. Diamond Prox will get proxed for the passive. Lodek now running for his life. Edward doing what he can to protect it, but at the end of the day, Ascension coming out clutch in the fight. These fights are just so messy though. There is no one really winning. We kill people, we disengage, we reset, we go again. And that is what is gonna be the case one more time. Lloyd was still free hitting. He's definitely ramping up on this Caitlyn to be very powerful at the same time. It just takes too long to kill these tanks. Lodic's doing damage. He's absolutely doing damage, but he's gone for the death stance third, which is a good choice to not die, but not to kill them. Rusty, a weird game. I love it. This game and the game before it, man, these close back and forth fights. I love the way Ascension play. Constantly on the edge, willing to take these risks, willing to start these fights. And Gambit on the opposite side just don't hesitate to go toe to toe. Oh, they're more than happy to go for it. Don't get me wrong, when I say it's a weird game, I do not mean it's a bad game. Oh no, I agree that the weird is probably fair. I did watch a Zack and a Orn and eventually a Rakan chase a Swain for I think a minute of game time. So I understand. For sure, definitely not uh, standard. That's the word we'll go for. With the picks everywhere on the map, you know, constantly starting these fights off as 4v4s. A lot of this is about the Orn engage as well. It's the most impactful part here for Gambit. That's how the Black Shield only hits one member. It gives entry as well for Zack for all of the follow-up magic damage that he actually has for himself to lock people down and to use that crowd control. That gets Lodic into the back line very successfully, but at the same time, Lloyd has been going insane in these fights as well, kiting super nicely. And Tresso, with the Trinity Force, does do damage. And that damage does contribute quite heavily to Diamond Prox dying there as well. And at the end of the day, when you think about it, two for two fight overall, another pick on Akira potentially. Flat four of the pillar, Akira getting pulled back, slowly ticking from the Trundle ultimate. Is that a flash from him? Is he gonna go down? Oh no, oh, no the snipe. Oh, you can't. Oh. All right, airstrike averted. Closer than it needed to no be, No Faker though. cosplay today. No need to die to that. But now the Baron has been started. Ascension with their eyes on the prize. 31 minutes into the game. No man advantage. The Kira again. quite low. Once again, Orn starting the fight off. That cool event has been burned. No one is there to follow up. Trundle in the middle of everything. Has used his ulti as well. So Orn going to get taken down quite quickly. Kaisa, will she get locked down? The CC is there and burned through. Lloyd strong enough now to bring it home. Kira with the low health bar. Can he get any more? Lloyd, Lloyd. not going to hesitate. He flashed in one more time. This time he's going to get it. No mistakes, no remorse, not giving up after last game when it turned against him for flashing forward. He will once again come in clutch for this lineup. And fantastic stuff from Lloyd. They're still going forwards here, Ascension, looking for kills, but those two members are really hard to take down. It's about the push. They'll get themselves the turret. 
And they may even go back to the Baron after the successful fight. They've got plenty of time. The double oceans, though. PvP Stales is going to be full health. He's ready to disrupt this. Ultimate, though, back up for the Trundle. He's ready to steal all those stats away. Lloyd going to heal up off the Honey Fruit. A nice spawn to have, but doesn't seem like either team can actually get the Baron. There's just no life steal from the Caitlyn, so hitting the Baron is just something that's going to hurt them quite a lot. Stales may just be able to walk in here. Just get taken out is interrupting his attempt to leave. They are just going to cut through the tank, are going to take him down. But it has stalled the Baron for now. Kaisa is on the way. They have to be careful. They have to respect it. The kill's big. The kill is very big for stopping the Baron, like you mentioned. At the same time, it was a nice trundle pillar that enabled that pick in the first place, preventing him from dashing the safety successfully. Yawn does go down. Not a lot of resistances on him right now. Of course, wanting to scale up for his next item. It'll be a significantly higher amount of resistance against the Caitlyn. But we are at a point in this game, 32 odd minutes in, where the Caitlyn's items are large. Can carry pretty much by himself, and that's exactly what Ascension are looking towards for late game. They're TP coming now out. coming in. Caitlyn using the ulti early, trying to get these carries away from the fight. Kaisa ready to go in in a moment's notice. Diamond, can he take this one away? They're waiting. They've stopped focusing the Baron. They're just looking for the kills instead. Diamond parks in the middle of everything. G4 wants to go in. Kira trying to make his way out, but he gets taken down. Maybe do a little too late. Loading now trying to throw out the DPS. Lloyd on the backside. Rich still alive, still protecting his AD carry. And Rocky just about unkillable on the front line. Edward gets taken down. Ascension winning yet another fight. The Baron not in their sights quite yet. Maybe Lodic can turn it here. Is he going to get it? He has so much healing. He gets the double. Kaisa is out of control in this game. Rocky cannot kill him. The death stance is too strong. Lodek with the moves. Making it look easy in the end, playing on the edge of his seat, and Rocky now just has to run for his life. Don't think he's going to make it out of this one. I cannot believe it, Gambit. The fight turns in their favor. And Lodic, the rookie of the team as well, coming into this game. Super clutch, the death stance, the healing of the Kaiser was honestly just insane. Back to the Baron now. The dance continues around the purple worm. But this time around, more people dead for him, Ascension, There's than you would like. G4 is coming in. He's ready. I, I don't think he does enough damage to heal through the lifesteal of Lodek. We're going to have to find out. The tango continues, though. 4k health and getting lower. In comes the Trundle. They don't have a smite. If they keep doing this, Diamond Pox is on the way. They can't continue to do Ascension. this with a smite there. If they get in, and Trezo a little too desperate though, they're just baiting him into the fight. They pulled in both members. This could be disaster for the side of Ascension. Yes, it turns against them. Baron will reset, but now it is Gambit. Four members strong, the jungler dead on the opposite side. Finally, Rusty, we will see a Baron go down. Gambit able to secure it in the end. It took a very long time, but the battle dance is won in the end by the Gambit roster. They play and they prove that they are too strong just as the individuals. It came down to an outplay as the only reason that they're able to secure the Baron in the end. So one by one, everyone funneled into the river. They took a shot at the title, but Gamma come out with the title. You just don't want to be one of Kaisa. Space Bane cannot be stopped, Rusty. You do not go in for the 1v1s against a champion like that. So much healing. Apparently you don't 1v3 the Space Bane either. She's way too strong. It's the death stance, man. I just it's so gross. Credit Credit to the itemization where it's due as well for him. That could have been an Infinity Edge, could have been a Last Whisper if he wanted to kill people, but he acknowledged the state of the game, what he needed to purchase, and made it work. And now we have to take a look at back that last exchange brought to you by Acer Predator. Big fight actually here with Diamond Prox wanting to go forward at the start. G4 has been the most prolific member, but we're at a point in the game where he does start to get outscaled. And with Kira caught, and with a Maokai on top of you, there is no such thing as escape. Lodic using the ult aggressively, wanting to push them away. But from this point, you know you're stuck. Lodic's just going to do as much damage as he possibly can, kite for as long as he can, and acknowledge that the only option I have right now is to go forwards oh, and try and Oh, God, take it's so much damage, Rusty. The healing is insane. The Orn ultimate also comes in at the correct moment to keep him going. But having the rockets with Death's Dance is just so much healing. And return. remember, this is not 8 9. Those are single target, Rusty. You press Q in a wave, you push that Akathian Rain when it's upgraded, you just heal so much. And the finer details are things that you'll notice the next time if you want to watch that back again. When he is locked down by Maokai, he uses the W, which is an animation that then gets cancelled by being crowd controlled. That does damage to Lloyd. That actually helps to getting the kill. Mastery so of the changes. 
And now you can see things are starting to fall apart. And Trezzo is so squishy here until he uses the all TG4. Already forced to use the hourglass. Rocky in the middle of the team, but Lodic untouched. Kira untouched. The carries able to free hit onto the back line. G4 wants to turn it, but Lodic just Lodic doesn't in. care. Lloyd is next on the menu. This man is a ruthless predator. He will not stop in the face of Ascension. Looking to bring it home in the end. And Trezzo just going to have to walk out of his own face. Cannot do anything to stop it. A beautiful performance by Gambit. A beautiful performance by Lodic. Will net them their second win. Once again, it wasn't the cleanest of games, but you wouldn't have it any other way. It comes down to those individual shows. And Lodic is the man that does it when it mattered most. Absolute insanity, Rusty. I just... <laughs> Kaisa is disgusting. <laughs> Lodic is a fantastic player, but... I mean, you could just see... You do the maths as well, right? I mean, you watch that game, and you see Kira, and you see that they're clearly tunneled on the Azir, and I feel like a little bit was like, last game, Azir was the problem. And then when we rewatched that fight, I thought it was Kira doing all that damage, but no. Nope. Oh no, sir. All of the procs, all of the percentage damage, the Rage Blade fully stacked. That's the thing, right? In a game with a million tanks available, we actually saw it in the LCK finals as well. We know how much damage a Kaiser can do in a four tank style composition. A team that has the Kaiser tends to be the one that wins that game. With all the percentage damage that is available. Caitlyn strong. Caitlyn can control the lanes, can cause siege compositions, give gold advantages, but never really cements yourself the victory. The Kaiser still exists and scales, gets the items, and does what we saw. And the thing that always holds Caitlyn back from being that late game carry, right, comparable to the Jinx or the Tristana, is the lack of the attack speed steroid, right? And Kai'Sa, with that supercharger, definitely not short on attack speed steroids or stealths. Or mobility. Or mobility. And, and you see the fights that were going well when they got to start on their terms, Ascension. But the second the Gambit gets the engage that they want, where the Zac is leaping in, where the Orn gets to start the fight off, suddenly, the second... Caitlyn is hit by any CC. Mm -hmm. She plays scared for the rest of the fight. She can't do anything. And there was a lot of CC in the first place, right? Zach going forward, the Orn ultimate as well. It's all at such a long range that there was no safe place for the Caitlyn to ever be. She was just constantly under threat, under siege, had to play out of her mind to even keep them close in that game when a front-to-back team fight happens. And I think if you're looking in general, Kaisa might want to be banned away. I think there may be some counterplay yeah. of shutting her down in the early game. But also, Rakan has been such a strong pick today. And we saw it taken away now from Rich. Yeah. Signif I think still a fantastic Morgana player. You're right. You were good to give him credit. But you can see that the impact is just not the same when you can't completely dictate when fights start and when you get out with a champion like Rick. I think we just overall are starting to see the unsung heroes of these rosters actually step up and be super huge as well here. The supports in particular, Edward Rich, maybe didn't win this game, but still looks super clean and credit where it's due for them. Yeah, and after three games, let's take a look at where the teams are standing currently, how they're stacking up. 2-0 record for Gambit. And yeah. Rainbow Seven w looking to play in their next game to keep up with there. I, what's the big surprise here, Rusty, if any? I mean, Ascension being 0-2 is the biggest surprise of all, you would have to imagine. Of course, it's only been three games today. There's still an opportunity for redemption. That's a double round robin as well, so they can well and truly come back. But the reason that it's the biggest surprise to me so far is they haven't looked bad. There's, no, look there's been moments where they've been games. exploited, but yeah, they have looked, they've looked super competitive. They've shown that they can keep up with these teams that have actually beaten them. Yeah, true. And I mean, if right now, if, if your name is Raz, you must be really sad because your predictions are it's pretty upsetting. totally wrong. Way off. Yeah, absolutely. Well, coming up next is the Battle of Latin America between Rainbow Seven and Chaos Latin Gamers. And Saya outlined how important a victory here is for the fans. It's like super long history. Like it's been f back and forth. Like who wins? Uh, like it used to be like last. Now it, for a while it's been like land, and like the fans are like really intense over it. Like we 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 the players aren't actually that intense over it, but we know that if we lose, we're gonna get like flamed super hard. Like the, it's like pretty much the pride of the whole region. So we're like super scared of the fans. Like if we lose, it's pretty much like we can like get last of the group but we have to like beat like uh klg pretty much like that's we have to beat them <laughs>